Hi, this is Penny, and in this lesson, we will be discussing reflection. Here is what we know so far. Luminous sources emit light, and light follows a straight path called a ray. This is called the ray model of light. Objects that do not emit light are called non-luminous, but they can be seen when illuminated. Materials are classified based on how much light passes through them. Transparent materials allow most light through, translucent materials allow some, and opaque materials prevent most light from passing through. Okay, so we're getting a better idea of what light is and how it behaves. And now, let's try to answer the question. How does light allow us to see a non-luminous object? You probably don't think of light as doing too much. It's just there during the day when the sun is out or when you turn on a light. But light is busier than you think. It's constantly moving from one point to another and, as it does, it can be absorbed by material, move through it, and even bounce back. It's this bouncing back that is a very important property of light as it allows us to see non-luminous objects. When light bounces off material, we call it reflection. And we can see evidence of reflection everywhere. The most obvious source is when you wake up in the morning and look in a mirror. If you haven't had time to check out your own reflection today, then maybe you saw someone or something else's reflection, like the reflection of this bird at the water surface. When we discuss reflection, this is usually what people think of, a perfect reflected image of the original object. But reflections aren't always perfect. Sometimes they are a little fuzzy, or sometimes you don't think you're seeing a reflection at all. But guess what? You wouldn't be able to see any of these things, including the giraffe and the rope it's walking on, without the reflection of light. Reflection allows us to see all those non-luminous objects that we've been talking about. So how does this work? Surface characteristics play an important role in reflection. Here we have an image of a man in white running shoes jogging on an asphalt road covered in puddles. Notice how the white objects in the image appear brighter than the rest. This is because lighter objects reflect more light than darker ones. Dark objects actually absorb light. The white running shoes therefore appear brighter than the dark asphalt. Notice how the puddles are highly reflective. This is because smooth surfaces reflect light much better than rough surfaces. But why is this? We're going to talk about light absorption by colors in a later lesson. But for now, let's consider how the surface texture can affect reflection. Let's start with a flat two-dimensional surface. We call this a plane. Assume the surface is highly reflective, like a mirror. To simplify things, I'll show you what happens when a single ray strikes the surface. The incoming ray travels in a straight line towards the surface. We call this the incident ray. The incident ray will strike the surface at the point of incidence. The ray then bounces off, creating a reflected ray. To determine the direction of the reflected ray, we can draw an imaginary line perpendicular to the surface from the point of incidence. This imaginary line is referred to as the normal. The angle between the incident ray and the normal is known as the angle of incidence, or I, and this is always equal to the angle of reflection, or R. This is known as the law of reflection. Now what happens if we change I, or the angle of incidence? All reflected light obeys the law of reflection. These examples show that no matter what the angle of incidence is, the angle of reflection is always the same, even if the plane itself isn't horizontal. So why can we see our reflection in some materials but not in others? The answer to this has to do with the surface texture of the object. Here we have several parallel incident rays striking a smooth, highly reflective surface. If we draw a normal for each incident ray, we see that the normal lines are also parallel. Each ray will follow the law of reflection, and the reflected rays move away parallel to each other in a single outgoing direction. Our eyes are then able to interpret this as a clear image. We call this type of reflection specular, which comes from Latin and means mirror-like. Sources of specular reflection are pretty obvious, like the still water we've already seen, mirrors and polished metal like this stainless steel sculpture. These are all mirror-like surfaces. I already mentioned that lighter objects reflect light well, so why can't I see my reflection in a lighter object, such as the white space in this newspaper? Again, this all has to do with surface texture. Even though paper looks smooth and flat, if we zoom in really close, we can see that the surface is more irregular. And as the incident rays strike different parts of the surface, we see their normal lines aren't parallel, 
and their different angles cause the reflected rays to be scattered off in many different directions. This leads to diffuse reflection, which again comes from Latin and means to pour out or away. Instead of giving us a nice clear reflection, these materials are dull or matte in appearance. So how can we form an image with reflection? Well, let's go back to those reflective surfaces for a minute. How does the image you see in a mirror actually form? If light from a luminous source shines on a non-luminous object, such as this bird, light will reflect off the surface of the bird in all directions. Some of the light reflected from the bird's head will be directed towards the mirror and reflect according to the law of reflection. The rays that reach the bird's eye appear to be coming from behind the mirror. If we repeat this process for other parts of the bird, the brain is able to interpret all these reflected rays and piece together an image. But this is just for a plain mirror. What happens when the mirror is curved? Curved mirrors can still produce reflections. However, they aren't quite as straightforward as those of plain mirrors. Imagine a mirror that is molded to the outside of a sphere. If the inside surface is reflective, we call this a concave mirror. Concave comes from Latin and means curved and hollow. These mirrors are caved in, like the inside surface of a spoon. When incident rays strike the surface of a concave mirror, the different angles of the surface cause the reflected rays to come together or converge at a single point called the focus. Reflections in concave mirrors are often upside down and may be smaller or larger than the actual object. These types of reflections can be projected onto another surface, such as a screen. For this reason, we call these images real. Now let's consider what would happen if the outer surface of the mirror was reflected. When a curved mirror bulges out, we call this convex, which is Latin for arched. When incident rays strike the surface of a convex mirror, the different angles of the surface cause the reflected rays to move apart or diverge. Reflections in convex mirrors create images that are right side up, but they appear much smaller and farther away than the actual object. They cannot be projected onto a screen, and these images are called virtual. And here's the big picture for this lesson. Reflection of light enables us to see non-luminous objects. Light-colored objects and smooth surfaces are good reflectors. Light follows the law of reflection, in which the angle of incidence is always equal to the angle of reflection. The angles are measured between the incident or reflected ray and an imaginary line called the normal. Reflection is classified as specular or diffuse. We discussed three types of mirrors. Plain mirrors produce real, life-size images. Concave mirrors curve in and produce real images. Convex mirrors bulge out and produce virtual images. Thanks for watching.